Good evening. I want to extend a really warm welcome to everybody who come out tonight. This is a great crowd. It's nice to see the auditorium bustling with people and, and uh, open minds. Um, I want to welcome you to the first Dan Doyle Colloquium Series event for this academic year. Um, <clears throat> we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Gary Soika tonight. He's a professor emeritus of biology and the 13th president of Bucknell University. Uh, his talk tonight is entitled Feeding the Future. Can we feed 9.7 billion people by the year 2050? Dr. Soika is a cum laude graduate of Coe College and holds master's and doctoral degrees from Purdue University in biochemical genetics and microbiology. He holds an honorary doctor of laws from Lycoming, an honorary doctor of science from Purdue, and an honorary doctor of humane letters from Bucknell. He's held faculty positions at Indiana and Bucknell universities also. He's been president of the Pennsylvania Association for Colleges and Universities, commissioner of Middle States Association of Colleges and Schools, and participated on the Snyder County Planning Commission. I'm not sure how he has time to do all his research as well. <laughs> Dr. Soik has been recognized for excellence throughout his professional career. He was elected to the Coe College Football Hall of Fame, as well as the Bucknell Hall of Fame, uh, Athletic Hall of Fame. Bucknell's basketball venue, which you may have seen on TV, uh, is, has been named in his honor as, as the Soika Pavilion. He's received numerous regional awards for his work, including the Adam Smith Award from Economics Pennsylvania, the Sheepskin Award of the Pennsylvania Association of Colleges and Universities, and was named Outstanding Alumnus of Coe College. He's also served as President of the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy and the Philadelphia Society for the Promotion of Agriculture. Gary and his wife Sandy are endangered livestock breed conservators in Middleburg, PA currently, where they operate a farm that specializes in endangered breeds of sheep and poultry. But this is a particular honor for me because, well, I guess it's a long time ago now. Uh, I was a college student at Bucknell, and I was sitting where you are. And the inspiration that I gained from Dr. Soika, as well as my other professors, was that the whole point of going to college is to pursue specialized education in your field. And that's what we do here. But it's also important to equally, it's equally important to broaden your horizons, be curious, and always look beyond your boundaries. And those of you who have taken some of my classes, you know that's something I harp on a lot. <laughs> but I hope that tonight gives you some of the same college experience and leaves you with some fresh ideas and perspectives. Thank you. Dr. Soite. Thank you. Uh, am, I, am I turned on? I guess I am. Okay. Oh, well, I, I, again, I want to thank Professor Cooley. I, I certainly want to... Uh, thank Wendy Miller for being an incredible hostess. And uh, I also, if, if Greg Miller is here, I want to thank him too for letting me crash his course, uh, his, his class, because I think visiting two classes today gave me a much better understanding of this institution. I've been here a number of times, and uh, I guess not worked in this room, but I've worked in some others, and I've come up to visit your CAD CAM lab, and of course I'm a if possible, almost a weekly visitor to Le Jeune Chef, and, and I have a very warm spot for being here. So for me, it's a delight to be with you tonight, and I promise to be as brisk as possible because I know you are all just waiting with bated breath to get home and see the vice presidential debate, right? That's bound to be full of excitement. But this, of course, this symposium tonight ties in to your overriding concern about sustainability. And of course, you can have sustainability in all kinds of different ways, about all kinds of different things. But today, we're going to talk about sustainability in the area of food production. Okay? And the way we're sort of setting that up is to talk about feeding the future, realizing that whether we like it or not, we're going to be joined on this planet in the next few decades by another two or two plus billion people. Billion with a B. And we'll emphasize that over and over again as we go through some things tonight. I'm also going to tell you in advance that I'm going to sort of deal with the relatively small number of topics tonight and I'm just going to present them in one way, then go back and present them in another way, and let you draw a conclusion, and then see if we can all together see our way forward a little more clearly into the future. Okay? So, and I, by the way, the other thing I'm impressed with is the way you guys can do audio-visual things. 
I, I, every time I'm going to push this button, I'm, my jaw is going to drop in amazement because we don't do this well at Bucknell. Am I doing it right? I'm doing it right, okay? Uh, let's start with a few factoids, just individual facts, and I'm hoping that as you look at them, you're going to see that they don't seem to be compatible. They seem to be, some of them, at odds with each other. So let's see what we can come up with. The first is that the world's population is going to add between 2.5 and 3 billion by 2050. And you could say, well, or maybe it'll be 2 billion, 600 million or something. These are, these are estimates. And we're not going to ring down the curtain on 2050. That's a little far out for me to think about, but you guys are going to be in mid-stride in 2050, so you need to kind of think about what the world's going to be like because it's going to be the place where you're making your, your careers, your families, and so on. It's not that far out into the future. The growth in population, of course, is not going to be even across the face of the Earth. And if there's a big take-home lesson tonight, that's it. When you hear about population growth, remember it doesn't mean that every place is going up. It means that some are going down, some are going up, and the overall net increase is to, supposed to be around two to two and a half billion by 2050. Am I getting anywhere here? Oh, I got everywhere all at once. It, <laughs> this is an important point. At this moment, the world has plenty of food for all of us. All 7.6 billion of us that are here now could all be well fed right now if we had a way to distribute the food evenly and equitably. You can see how well we're doing with that. Because much of the world's population is significantly food insecure, and as embarrassing it is for us to realize this, that is true of the United States of America. We have significant food insecurity. I suspect you have it in this county. I know there are young people, children, certainly pre-college age, in Schneider County, my home county, that really can't count on the next meal at home. They need something from school or from some organization, the, the community center or the Y or something, because the family really cannot, on a regular basis, provide adequate nourishing food, and that is an embarrassment, but it happens to be true, okay? Uh, there's significant starvation in the world. Food insecurity is one thing. To starve to death is quite another. Now, we know that's gone on since time immemorial. I mean, you know, look at the biblical period and everything. You know people starve, and you know people died, and you know there was starvation in China and starvation in India and starvation all over the place. People do starve. The, the, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the rider on the black horse holding the balances is, of course, the symbol of starvation. Not food insecurity, but starvation. Malnutrition is a huge global problem. But that's different and broader than food insecurity and starvation. I'm malnourished because my caloric intake is not appropriate to my overall configuration. Uh, I'm, I'm on that balance point between overweight and obese, and that means I'm malnourished. My nourishment is not appropriate. It seems that everybody is either <laughs> gets too little or gets too much. Uh, I look around this room, and some of you guys seem to be making, making that an incorrect statement. But if you look around America, there are a lot of people that are too pudgy, and then there are a lot of people that are just barely hanging on. Okay? People are increasingly dependent on commodity food. What is commodity food? Well, commodity is an interesting term. It means anything that can be bought or sold in a public or private setting. That's a pretty pointless uh, definition. When I talk about commoditized food, 
I'm basically saying you don't know where it comes from. It could come out of a great big bin and lots of farmers could put the food in there and other people could take it out and it's all just one commodity. When it really begins to pinch is when we think about some of those burgers you buy all stacked up <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the supermarket, frozen in a package. You know, they're all preformed patties. Think about this. Where, where did that beef come from? What kind of beef is that? Who grew that? Well, here's the issue. If something goes wrong, if somebody eats one of those patties, a little undercooked, and gets sick with E. coli, the recall is enormous. They'll recall the meat from the entire western part of the United States or northeastern United States and Canada and so on. Why? Because that commoditized meat, before it's made into patties, is essentially a fluid. Grind up a cow, throw it in a vat. Grind up a cow, throw it in a vat, mix the big vat up, and stamp out the patties. One sick cow, and all this stuff is potentially contaminated. And so, you know, that's, that's a classic example of commoditized food. But think about your cornflakes. Was that corn grown in the United States? Was it grown in Canada? I mean, you know a few things. You know it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have re-engineered genes in it because we don't allow that to happen in cornflakes. But you don't know much about it. It's a commodity, okay? And it's bought and sold and traded on an electronic market. There is no face-to-face -face buying and selling and trading where there's a face on your food, okay? Increasingly, this population is depending not on a farmer to customer or a farmer to middleman to customer system, but a actual global, global food production system. Okay, and we're going to talk about that system quite a bit tonight. We know that there's an enormous amount of food waste. Okay, if we're thinking about feeding an additional two billion people and we got enough food now, if we're wasting a lot of it, and I mean a lot of it, that gives us some hope right there. A way to get us into the future is to start, stop wasting it to the degree that we do. But you might say, well, wait a minute, I grew up in a household where my mom said, clean your plate, and we didn't throw anything out, and we're not wasting food. Well, that's not where most of the food waste is. A lot of the food waste simply happens in the fields. We buy our food at supermarkets, right? What sense do you use in a supermarket? Do you hear your food? Do you smell your food? Do you taste your food? Do you look at your food? And if it's displayed out there on a counter and you can pick the ones you want, it's not to the supermarkets or the food producers' benefit to put ugly food out there. You're buying your food with your eyes, and there's a whole lot of very good, very nutritious food that gets left in the fields, gets thrown away, because it's not suitably pretty to put in the supermarket, okay? There's that kind of waste, and then a lot of you have seen, if you live in these agricultural regions, as you're driving down the highway, you see during harvesting season, there's corn, there's beans, there's stuff all over the roadside, spread all over the place, because handling it and moving it loses a lot of it. And some gets lost in processing plants and everything. If we were very scrupulous about food waste, that would be a huge benefit toward getting into the future. And the current system, the present system, causes a great deal of pollution. We look at farms and we think these are these wonderful, pristine, beautiful places. You're next to nature and all the labels on all the foods are about, you know, Happy Valley Fresh Milk or something. Everybody puts the nice labels on them and it looks all pure and clean. But one of the greatest polluters on the planet are, are not tire burning plants or traffic jams in Los Angeles or things of that sort, but there's stuff that happens on the farm where we're growing the food that we absolutely depend upon. So keep in mind that uh, this can be a very polluting business, and we have to worry 
significantly about its sustainability. Okay, let's see if I can get something there. Okay, so the first thing we better look at quickly is the issue of demographics. I've just been blithely throwing out there that we're going to have another 2.5 billion people. Every time I do this, somebody says, hey, come on. If things get tough, who says we're going to have another 2.5 billion people? No, we're not. People aren't going to have babies. They're going to worry about that. They're going to shut down, and we're not going to have it. And I think we'll find that that's not necessarily true. We're going to talk about a very slippery concept, I'm going to talk about it in just a couple of minutes, called the carrying capacity. Ecologists love to talk about that. It's supposedly the maximum population of a given species that can be maintained steadily on or in a given environment. Sounds simple. I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes why it's slippery, and it's not simple, but it is important and start thinking about the environment as planet Earth and start thinking about the species, the maximum level of which we're worried about, as us. What is the carrying capacity of Mother Earth for Homo sapiens sapiens? And I can tell you right now, we have no idea. But we don't want to mess with Mother Nature, okay? Because that could be bad. We know the environment is changing, but it always changes. I'm not talking necessarily about climate change. That we, we can talk about that later, if you want, and in, if time permits. But I'm talking about the fact that we changed the environment. Look, when we hunted and gathered, there was X amount of food, and that was the environment. Now, we produce our own food through agriculture, and it's like 100X. It's a different environment with regard to the carrying capacity. We're going to spend a little bit of time on the human growth curve. It's my hope that that's not going to be new or strange information for you. If it is, I can slow down or we can go back to it in the question section, but I'm going to run through that fairly quickly, okay? And we're going to talk about different growth rates in different regions. I alluded to that earlier, and we're going to examine that in more detail as we continue to move forward, because that's critical to the question of can we feed this additional two billion people. And what makes those growth rates different is we have different age and gender profiles in different places. Different relationships of age in the whole population, whether the population is primarily under the reproductive years, in the reproductive years, or older than the reproductive years. And it's that distribution that pretty well dictates whether a population will go, will grow, will shrink, or will stay the same. Okay, there's that human growth curve that we were talking about. And very quickly, I'm just going to mention that we think our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, has been on this planet in our current modern form for about 200,000 years. So, you know, this much back over here. Look at where the growth curve is. It's pretty much flat. That's a few million people. A few million. And that was the way it was for the vast majority of the time that our species has been on this planet. Nice flat curve. One way to say that is we're in balance with nature. Another way to say it would be this line represents the carrying capacity for our species by good old Mother Earth. That's how many of us she could support. But then look, something begins to happen out in here. And look at these dates. Look at back in here. Here's year one. Back about in here is where we might begin to see the so-called Neolithic Revolution. We might begin to see food production, and then we begin to see things really turn up. That's because, again, age distribution curves are building up down here. They're setting us up to start expanding rapidly. But it's not all about having more food. It's also this great increase in population, which is becoming logarithmic, is as much due to improvements in public health as it is to adequate food. People don't die as quickly. Okay? They live 
longer. They are more likely to live into their reproductive years. They are more likely to have children. Their children are more likely to live to have children. There's plenty of food, or more or less plenty of food, for all of them, and you get this e extreme increase, where now, up in here, you have more people alive at any moment than all of the people that preceded them in the history of our species. That's rather amazing. And if that ain't bad enough, as they say, we now want to throw another couple of billion in there and go up into there. So let me back up a little bit and talk about this. Here's what I've said before. These are pictures of the distribution of the growth rate on planet Earth. And the thing to take home, the, the, the key point is, the developed countries aren't growing much. They're pretty stable. Some of them are even going down, okay? But look where the growth is. It's in the so-called underdeveloped countries, and you can break that down even further, and you'll notice the world population is going up, not because Europe's going up, not because North America's growing up particularly, but because Sub-Saharan Africa's growing up, Latin America's growing up, Asia's growing up, and that's Asia minus Japan and minus China where growth is either backing up or leveling off. So we have, cumulatively, in, on average, a rapid increase in the total human population, but it's not coming where it came in the past, and it's not coming in places where we are necessarily able to deal with it. Now let's go back to carrying capacity, and if I get through this point and we decide to stop, that will be enough for today, because this is a key point. That is a highly stylized graph. I just drew that, okay? Actually, one of my colleagues drew that. Is Mike McGuire here? Wave his hand if he is. I have a colleague who helped me with this, fine young man who's, I guess, up there, and he drew this graph, and I think it's pretty accurate. And uh, here's the issue. This is a stylized curve. This could be any environment, any organism. You inoculate a tube with bacteria, or you put algae in there, or you put some animals in a new environment, and they will grow up rapidly until they reach the so-called carrying capacity, the maximum population density that this specific environment can support. Okay, that's, that's what we're calling the carrying capacity. So it's the maximal the maximum sustainable population size that the environment can support if food, water, and other resources are constant. And that's critical, okay? Now, in the real world, not, an, not just a stylized curve, in the real world out in here, oh, I did it again. Um, okay, in the real world, up in here, it's not going to be a curve that looks like that. It's going to oscillate, just like the temperature in this room oscillates around a fixed point. When it gets too hot, the air conditioning comes on, or it's supposed to, and when it gets too cold, the heat's going to come on, and it oscillates around some fixed point. That's what you're ordinarily going to see here. But let me tell you about an observation that should cause you concern. Just a funny little story I'm going to tell you about some people in the Pribilof Islands wasn't an experiment. They were looking for a way to grow more reindeer because the reindeer populations were dropping in the surrounding area, and they found an island which had no large mammals on it. It had plenty of vegetation, and it looked like it might be a great place to put some reindeer and let the population grow up. And so they took a breeding group of about 10 animals, a couple of males and about eight females, and they put them on this island down here, and each year in the spring, they would come back and measure. And the population followed a growth curve pretty much like that. And about here, they expected it to continue to do this, but when they came back, it was down here. And they thought, well, some horrible disease has hit, or some predator has found its way over here, and they examined, and they couldn't find any evidence of that. But what they did see evidence of is what do reindeer eat? They eat the part of the forest under the canopy, the shoots and startups of saplings and small trees. They nibble on those, and there was plenty of them, and the population went up and up and up and up and up, 
until all of a sudden a reindeer bends down to get some and there isn't any. Does it mean it's gone forever? No. But these things don't come back instantaneously, but animals eat every day. And they better eat something within the week or they're going to die. And this stuff couldn't come back in a week. So here's this perfectly happy population going up, 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 up. And when they come back, after it had exhausted a slowly recovering food source, they died off horribly, starved, and went way down below the initial starting population. If this could happen to us, I truly pray I won't be here. And I think you should feel the same way. We've had horrible bumps in our, in our history. We've had the bubonic plague, hardly made a bump on the human growth curve. We've had the First World War, the Second World War, the Spanish flu, where lots and lots and lots of people died and it was horrible and anybody that lived through it can't even imagine anything so bad and it hardly made a dent in the human growth curve because it's got that much power moving forward. But if we destroy our ability to replace the food that we need or the air that we have to breathe or the water that we must use and drink so that we can't get it back fast enough, we could have a disaster much more significant than the plague, the wars, the Spanish flu, the whatever you want to think of. And I don't want to live to see that. And I don't think you do either. Okay, here's again just a review of why we can be pretty certain some populations are going to go up and some are going to go down. Those are just pictures of the age and gender distribution of a couple of three countries. One of them, let's take a look at Nigeria, a rapidly growing country. Where's the bulk of the population? I did it again. Where's the bulk of the population? It's down here under the reproductive years. What do we know for sure? The people down here are going to grow up into here. So this big group of people is coming up here and they're all going to start having babies for a fairly large percentage of them, and we can calculate what the likelihood is that they'll have them and how many they might have, and what's that going to do? It's going to make this even bigger down here. And their population is going to continue to be skewed low, and it's going to grow like crazy. Let's look over here at Japan. This is a shrinking population, and this is interesting. Japan, for many years, was an exporter of human beings. More Japanese were born than the, than the island could support, and Japanese people went to many different places, including the United States. And there was the whole business of cheap labor and all that stuff. Now look. Look where the bulk of the Japanese population is. It's clear out here in the way past the reproductive age. The Japanese culture is aging. Look at who's coming down here to replace them. It's shrinking. Japan is having to start thinking about importing labor. Imagine that, a country that was exporting human beings because it didn't have work or resources for its people now may have to bring in people. Let's look at the United States. I was like a big fat person, but uh, look, if you take off this group right in here and just forget about it, we're up here, I'm in this group, we're the people on life support. You know, we're, we got stents and pacemakers and oxygen up our nose and everything. You could argue whether we are or aren't alive, but anyway, we're up in there. Um, but let's look at the rest of this curve. Like right in here, it's kind of a big cylinder. This is, this is birth, death, immigration, and emigration. And it's pretty much in balance. You should be happy with the United States. We're maintaining a fairly constant population. And that has with it many benefits for us as citizens of this country, okay? Let's talk about how people have fed themselves over the years, okay? Trends in how people are fed. Uh, before, as soon as we came out of hunting and gathering and we got into the agricultural period, the first thing was subsistence farming. Your family, your tribe, your small village grew virtually everything it ate. Might supplement it a little bit still with some hunting and gathering. Think early American pioneers. They were growing crops, they were eating crops, they were canning things if they knew about that, or drying things, and they were occasionally shooting a squirrel or a deer or catching a fish, okay? But it's basically subsistence farming. Then 
you move to something like Rome or Egypt where you get this, dependence on a local distribution system. When you're in Egypt in the, in the Pharaonic period, um, there were a lot of people that weren't growing their own food. But they were getting it on a regular basis, usually distributed at the temples, or, or they could buy it at a market or a bazaar. And they had a limited local distribution system, and there was some trade across the Mediterranean and across the land, uh, along the edges of the oceans. And so people were beginning to trade, and people were eating things distant from where they grew them. Combination of local, regional, global growing platforms. That's where we are now, and that's what most of us know, okay? We know that some of our food is grown right here, but if you just had a strawberry in last February and you didn't get it from a greenhouse, you know darn well you didn't have it grow up out here in Pennsylvania. Things are moved around, uh, they keep us happy, and things are grown where they're more easily grown and where they can, we can have things in season all year long. But as we move forward, are we going to end up with increasing dependence on a true global food production system? And I think that is clearly the way we are moving in the world. There's some pushback against that in the United States right now, but we're moving toward a system. And here's what I want you to keep in mind. Nobody designed this system. Nobody maintains this system. Nobody could see the beginning or the ending of this system. It is a system of interlocking and interdependent food production systems gri driven by opportunity and economics. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not something that some genius sat down and said, let's do it this way. No, it's been evolving and it continues to evolve and nobody's really in charge of it. So why are we moving toward that system? Again, by way of simply repeating. We grow things where they grow best. Well, isn't that intelligent? I would hope. You know, why struggle trying to grow bananas in Pennsylvania? And why struggle trying to grow corn in a banana republic? Grow things where they grow best. That's what makes sense. Also, we move toward a system because we want things all year round, things that are fresh. We demand that, and there are people who will supply it. And we can gain the benefits of technology and economies of scale. If you're in the business of growing corn, it makes sense to grow it where you can really take advantage of technology. Gigantic tractors, huge corn planters, huge harvesting machines, economy of scale, economy of scale. And what does it do? It keeps food more affordable to more people. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. And if the fact that a few people, because it's becoming a bigger business all the time, start making a significant amount of money, so what? They're helping the world, aren't they? And so don't worry about that, but remember we're becoming increasingly dependent on that. So what are some of the potential problems with having a global food production system? Okay. One, we become extremely dependent upon transportation. If you want broccoli today, chances are it's coming from West Africa. What? But that's where we're growing a lot of it this time of year, and it has to come here and it has to have a big carbon footprint because it has to come here, but there are lots of things that can happen, right? First of all, it's dependent upon relatively cheap fuel. If fuel prices go up and you're having to move food long distances, food prices are gonna go up. Maybe that doesn't bother you. You can be college students. Think about people who are on the economic margins just hanging on, and food is already almost a luxury and they're food insecure and now the prices go up. There's pain in that, okay? We have to have open lines of transport. You gotta be able to freely move the, f the food from place to place, across oceans, from continent to continent, okay? Things like war and religious and political unrest 
disrupt those things. And that's a problem if you're dependent on it. If you're somewhere where you need large amounts of commoditized food and it can't reach you, you might find yourself in an odd, if you will, human-induced famine or food insecurity situation. Okay? There are international trade problems aplenty. I really don't want to go there because you're going to hear a vice presidential debate tonight and we have heard our political candidates pound each other over the head about how you make good deals or don't make good deals or whatever. I'm just going to make the simple statement that I think our moms taught us and it was probably a good thing that we learned in the sandbox. Good deals are deals that are fair to everybody. If we think the object is to skin the other guy, that becomes an unsustainable trade arrangement and significant numbers of people are going to end up suffering. We know that weather and other natural disturbances, if they're in places where we're making huge amounts of commodity food and it's disrupted, significant numbers of people far away from where this food's being grown are going to be significantly disadvantaged and possibly starved. Okay? And now here's a problem. This is a good thing. We have in this global food production system what I'm going to call a just-in-time inventory problem. If you don't know quite what that is, remember that we've got a hurricane bearing down on us. And if it hits and hits hard here, wait till it's just about to hit and run down to Wegmans or run down to Giant and look to see what's on the shelves and you're going to suddenly discover that we don't have a whole lot of food stored up, okay? The food is delivered to us just about the time we need it. And so if there's a significant disruption, we can go through our reserves very, very quickly. We have increasing dependence on commoditized food, and I've talked enough about commoditized food, but some of us eat nothing but that. We eat things we get in the grocery store, and I guarantee you that a lot of people have no idea where any of it came from or who grew it, okay? And when that happens, we get a loss of contact with the soil and with nature. And you might say, well, so what? But I'm saying that if, if we want to be serious, informed individuals who make decisions that will affect trade agreements and where things are grown and how they're grown and what people pay for them, we ought to know what it takes to grow these things and what might go wrong and what might be done better. Okay? And it's getting harder and harder to do that as we lose contact with the soil and with nature. Okay? So we do, do we have enough now? I've already said that we do. Okay? Food insecurity, though, is widespread. There is famine and starvation, and it's always been with us, and it seems to be. I just read a very distressing article just yesterday in The Economist about the impact of Boko Haram, I hope most of you know what that is, and its activities in the northeastern corner of Kenya. And the, the members of Boko Haram are very good at violence, they're very good at terrorizing people, they're very good at breaking things, they're very bad at administration. And when they get control of an area, they, they don't seem to be able to realize that things have to be grown for people to be fed and farmers get taken off the land, crops get destroyed and the heartbreaking thing, that I almost wept as I read the article in The, in the Economist, it was a blow by blow as a doctor was trying to insert a feeding device into the veins of a starving child and he couldn't find a vein that wasn't collapsed in either wrist or in his hand he went to the forehead to try to find a vein, couldn't get in, and in frustration said, that's it, dump him. Because there's no way to do it. He's too far gone. They just have to shrug their shoulders and say, let him die. That's so foreign to us, so strange from our way of looking at things that we've got to realize that, that we're not all that secure and what happens other places can happen almost anywhere. I mentioned that we either get too much or too little, okay? If we could distribute equitably, we have enough to feed the entire population right now. But it is this just-in-time inventory, and these numbers move all around, and it depends on which source you're looking at, but a pretty good average is 
that if the sun went out tomorrow, we got about three months of food if we distributed it equi equitably to keep the United States going, but it's only about a week worldwide. So if stuff goes to hell in a handbasket, we don't have much time to fix it, okay? So how are we gonna feed this other two billion people, okay? First, let me put the two billion in context. The year that I was born, and you're gonna laugh at this, was 1940. Yes, the Civil War was over. Yes, we did have telephones. Uh, but in 1940, the total world population was roughly two billion people. In the next couple of decades, we're gonna add what was the entire world population in the year that a human being standing in front of you right now was born. If you think things aren't speeding up, I don't know a better way to tell you. Agricultural food production is already the world's largest industry. It's huge. If you don't think so, just do the math. Seven and a half billion people. Let's just say on average, they like to eat three meals a day. Just say that, okay? What is that, 22.5 billion meals. Let's dollar denominate that. What would be a good number? Two dollars? One dollar? In Bangladesh, it's probably a nickel. In Manhattan, it's probably $60, okay? Uh, but say, say two dollars, okay? Do that math and then multiply that by 365 and one quarter days. And don't forget the one quarter because when we're talking about numbers that big, a quarter of a day matters. And we're talking about many, many trillions of dollars. It's the biggest industry we have. Okay, and we're totally dependent on it. You might say, I can't live without my cell phone, but yes, you can. You might be able to say, well, I can't live without my automobile, but yes, you can. But if you say, I can't live without food, no, you can't. It's absolutely, positively required, okay? Agriculture, as we do it now, is a terrible polluter. It's polluting the water, it's polluting the air, it's destroying the soil, it's consuming fossil fuels, and it's consuming inorganic fertilizer at terrifying rates. And it's also doing things like changing the shape of the world. When we build containment dams for the purpose of, of doing things like uh, irrigating, what happens to the silt? It settles out behind the dam, does not move downstream, and it should be a surprise to you, but it makes sense. Every river delta in the world is shrinking because silt is being deposited back away from the deltas. Examples of what we do, we got dead zones. We got waste and fertilizer runoff. We got fossil fuel consumption. We got emissions from machinery and animals. If you have an enormous herd of cattle, what do cattle do? They chew, they swallow, they belch, and what do they belch? The eradication of cattle is significant. It's a big bloop, and they're contributing a great deal, more than you would expect if they were just wild animals living at the normal carrying capacity but we've exceeded the normal carrying capacity with our domesticates and they are generally ruminants and they are belching out enough CO2 that they're actually affecting the atmosphere and that's affecting the weather. We are deforesting. If you don't think so, 1750, the year 1750, 5% of the world's Earth's surface was under agriculture. 1950, 50%. We are farming everything we can get our hands on. I know in the United States, I was talking to someone at dinner, that he's got part of his farm in the CREP program, you know, taking it out of production, I think, to manage prices and things, but worldwide, we're farming about everything we can farm. Salinization happens when you have to depend on irrigation, not typical flooding and then going down like you get in the Nile, but where you bring water a distance put it on the ground, it sinks in, evaporates up, and deposits the salts behind it. And after decades of irrigating, there's enough soil or enough salt built up in the soil that the soil ceases to be fertile and arable. And we've been doing that since the biblical era. We did it in 
in parts of uh, the Fertile Crescent and, and uh, current day Iran, so we, we realize that can be a big time problem. We do have many new technologies. We have machinery and cropping practices that are going to make more food available on a given amount of land. We can clearly reduce waste, okay? Uh, for example, I know many of you eat those baby carrot things in the grocery store. I had somebody tell me, I don't eat those. I don't eat that mutant stuff. Are those mutants? Do you know what that is? They're the carrots that were too ugly to sell in the grocery store, and somebody invented a machine that pared them down to those little things. Baby carrots are just the ground down part of big ugly carrots, okay? Um, we, can, we can increase the economy of scale. We can, again, grow things where it grows best in places where we can efficiently grow it, okay? So we can increase efficiency, but we gotta be careful. Governments and people who sell farm implements and seeds like to talk about yield. How many bushels of corn per acre? How many bushels of beans per acre? How many pounds of tomatoes per acre? That's not fertility. That's the measure of a monoculture, a single thing. And you can make the argument, I think reasonably well, that if you had mixed crops on the same amount of land, none of your yields of each of the crops would be as good, but your total productivity is likely to be higher. And that's something that we need to keep in mind. And of course, large operations require very expensive equipment. So if you're gonna do that, you're simply gonna put out of business small farmers, people around villages, things of that sort. If we're gonna to go to this global system and take full advantage of economies of scale, we may end up with what amount to agricultural sacrifice zones. We're not gonna have people living there, we're just gonna have gobs of food being produced and then shipped all over the place. A world different than we know now. And of course, monoculture. I haven't talked much about that, but many of these things that we do, we do as monoculture. One thing in the field, corn, or beans, or hay, or something. What's the biggest horrible example we know of a problem with monoculture? How many people in this room have an Irish last name? A few of you. How'd you get here? Well, you had to get here because there was the great Irish diaspora, right? Ireland had to spew out people because it couldn't feed them. And why couldn't it feed them? It couldn't feed them because they got dependent on a monoculture. I don't have time to talk about all the government screw-ups and the hard-hearted stuff and the bad policies. It was just that a population became very dependent on a single species, and when that species got sick and couldn't grow, that population started to die. Not get angry, not get upset, not go demonstrate in the streets, die and they were dead along the sides of the roads, and the ones that could make it to boats got out, and it was hideous. And don't let anybody tell you it wasn't. You just need to read the poetry, read the stories, you know how bad it was. Dependence on monoculture is dangerous. You, it, it's just like in the, when you're running your own stock portfolio. Diversification. Yeah, you might get rich on one stock, but if things go wrong with that, you could be in the bread line. You want diversification in your stocks, you want diversification in your food sources. New technologies, I've got an old Amish tractor there. He gave up on the horses, but he's still dragging this, this uh, uh, hay bine. It's being driven by ground traction, and he's got an old funny tractor like that. And here's something with, you know, it's being solar powered, it's got GPS, it can do all kinds of things. Very new, very old, but here's one of the problems. Does this technology really produce a lot more food per unit, of per unit of land? The people who sell the equipment would like to say yes, and they tell you yes, and you can't really say they're wrong because it does help a little bit. But I showed you earlier a picture of a great big combine mowing and harvesting wheat and dumping it into a truck. That's a source of significant food waste as the truck driver tries to stay in balance with the, with the combine and things are bouncing around, they have to give the chute room to swing around or it'll break off in the truck. And occasionally the truck veers off and some of it goes right back in the field, some of it bounces off in delivery. 
it would be a lot better if they could put that chute right down in the truck and put a kind of a cover over it. But they can't do that now because of uneven land and the drivers being coordinated. Well, what if you take the technology of self-driving cars and GPS operating things and you link the truck and the combine into one device driven by one person? And they're doing that now and they're cutting down food waste. And it's terribly expensive. But you say it's okay because they're saving something. Yeah, they're saving the 4 to 5% that might bounce out and get lost. It's going to take a lot of harvests and a lot of years to pay for that technology. But what else is it saving? You had two drivers. They had salaries. They had benefits. They had all this stuff. There was paperwork. Now you got one driver. What has technology in agriculture done for us? Yes, it has improved yield and productivity to some degree on the land, but it's done a better job of making things efficient by eliminating jobs for people. In 1940, 48% of the workforce of the United States was directly involved in food production. Today, it's 3%. Where'd the people go? They got replaced by this machinery. It made the, the productivity better in the sense of how many pounds of food per man hour, not how many pounds of food per acre, something to keep in mind, okay? We know that fertilizer and pesticides are a problem, but we're making headway in this stuff. Again, the guy that, that, that farms with me on my land is a big time farmer. My, my property is a small part of what he farms, so he can afford a big fancy machine that has a spectrophotometer in front of the nozzle that squirts out the fertilizer. And as he moves down the row, the leaf of a corn plant goes under the spectrophotometer, he gets a reading, and it tells, the computer makes a quick calculation and decides what's the optimum amount of fertilizer, and that's what gets squirted on the plant. Not more, not less. What does that do? It means he can get the same results with a lot less fertilizer. That's good for him, economically important. It's good for the environment, less runoff, okay? It's also good for the environment. It don't have to make as much of that fertilizer, which can be damaging to the environment in itself. Pesticides, some of the benefits there, genetically engineered plants. Corn with Bacillus, Bacillus thuringiensis genes in it makes its own insecticide. It kills the bugs that try to eat it. Would it kill you? Hasn't yet. We haven't seen anybody die from eating BT corn. Does it worry some people? Darn right. Okay, so that's something to be concerned about. Water issues, huge. Agriculture is the biggest utilizer of water. Water tables are dropping even in this country. Many of our rivers are no longer getting to the coast where they used to drop their, their water into the ocean. We're interfering with that through our intense use of water and the whole business of water rights is the Lawyers Full Employment Act in the United States. Who does the water of the Colorado River belong to? Does it belong to Arizona? Does it belong to Colorado? Does it belong to California? Fight, 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 fight. Pollution, we know we're polluting the waters. You can just follow our beautiful Susquehanna all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay, and what do you see? A gigantic dead zone. If you read Audubon's accounts of the Chesapeake Bay, the Crabs were so thick on the beach, you couldn't walk. You could just scoop up oysters. You could catch anything you wanted. And now, it's a dead zone all the way out. Why? Pesticide runoff, animal waste runoff, fertilizer runoff, eutrophication. We have damaged a great estuarian natural food production source. We can move to aquaculture. Interestingly, if you think about it, until just a few years ago, every time you ate fish or shellfish, you got it through some form of hunting and gathering, right? You caught it, you netted it, you dredged it. It wasn't being grown in a farm. It was wild, and you went out and got it, okay? We began to realize that that wasn't going to work as fisheries began to give out and whatnot. So we've started doing aquaculture for marine shellfish, 
for marine bony fish and for freshwater bony fish, okay? And there's a big question to keep in mind, what are we gaining when we do this? Well, we make it easier to get the stuff. We make it a little bit more secure in that we can pretty well predict what's there, but are we being easier on the environment? When you think about freshwater bony fish, think tilapia. And what does tilapia eat? Mostly they feed it corn and grains. Those things are, they can be reproduced, they can, they can be regenerated. When you feed salmon in a salmon farm, what do they eat? They're carnivores. You gotta go out and catch some other seafood to feed to them. So you're, you're, you're just displacing things a little bit. Plus, you've got all the problems of pollution, both on the freshwater and the saltwater situation. And you could ask about product. Almost anybody in this room, if, you, if they put it on your plate, you can tell the difference between wild-caught salmon and farmed salmon. There's differences in the, in the fleshy veins between the muscles and so on. You can tell by looking at it. And people prefer the fresh-caught. It's healthier. It's also much more expensive. And it's put in jeopardy by the pollution coming out of the farmed salmon because their wastes and, and what are called pernicious par and things are sneaking out of there. They're also growing increasingly plants in the ocean, particularly in Japan. This is a big industry and in some parts of Southeast Asia where certain kinds of seaweed and whatnot that are important parts of diet are no longer hunted and gathered but are farmed. We've got, we should know by now, we should have learned the lessons you can farm safely, you can farm sustainably. We better not screw up the oceans because if we do, it's game over. So those are some of the potential problems that we can run into there. Okay, we gotta be sure we know what we're feeding, we're keeping pollution down. I'll tell you one thing that is probably just a win-win all the way around. If any of you like oysters or mussels, you can tell the difference between, if you will, wild dredged oysters and farmed oysters, and you will like the farmed ones. They're cleaner, they're plumper, they're also cheaper. This sounds like a win-win to me, and they don't cause any additional pollution because they're not fed. They're filter feeders, and they're just sucking up the water just like they did if they were wild, and straining it out and growing. So there are some good things being done there. So what's to be done, okay? Reduce waste at the table, on the road, and in the field. Reduce the carbon footprint, that is we could be more locavores. We could start eating more locally. We could reduce meat consumption, and that breaks my heart, because I'm a meat producer, not just a carnivore, I'm a meat producer. But we do eat too much meat, and when you move up on the trophic scale from plants to animals, you only get about 10% of the total value of the previous trophic level. If we cut down our meat consumption and went a little bit more toward a plant-based diet, there would be more to go around. We could also start eating some other things. Much of the rest of the world, and for forever, has eaten insects. We do it occasionally as a kind of a, <laughs> you know, at the, at the, at the Bloomsburg Fair <laughs> this week, you can eat French fried tarantulas and French fried scorpions. No thank you, but anyway, it's possible, okay? We could eat more seasonally, which would take a little pressure off the, the carbon footprint of things that are grown far away and are brought to us just because we want to eat strawberries in season and so on. Urban agriculture, green roofs, vertical agriculture, vacant lots, indoor agriculture. All Pennsylvanians, puff up your chests and pound them a little bit because Pennsylvania is in a good position. We're a leader in this, and we're pushing hard. The Philadelphia Horticulture Society is doing a great job of turning vacant lots in what were food deserts into productive small farms. Green roofs are popping up around Philadelphia and other cities. We're starting to see indoor agriculture. In Easton, a, re a retired warehouse is being turned into an indoor agricultural facility, and they're using slant bed technology to get a lot more produce out of there than you would expect. And these things are all close to the consumers.
But the closest of all would be vertical agriculture. If you live in a high-rise apartment building, what could be better than having your little garden growing vertically on the wall of your building? Just imagine, reach out the window and pick your tomato. That's got no carbon footprint, right? So there are things like that that can be done. And we do have technological improvements in machinery, in genetics with genetically modified plants and animals and fertilizers. There's a price with every one of those things, but they hold out hope. So here's the big take home question. We can make it. We can feed another two billion people. The limitation is not technological, it is not biological. We have the wherewithal right now to do it. I have no doubts about that, okay? And I think people that have studied this would agree. But what does it require? Here's the problem. It requires, when I say government support, I don't mean the United States government, I mean the world government. If you go back to the biblical era, no, go back farther, go back to ancient Greece, and you look at how they were growing food then, and you look at how we're growing food now, and if that progress doesn't almost take your breath away, I'd be surprised. We are technically and biologically miles ahead of the classical cultures. Now what about statecraft? Are we any better at solving our problems, making our associations, agreeing on important issues today than we were then? And I think the answer is a, a, a screaming no. That's the problem, okay? We have to have the political will. We have to have the government support. We have to have cooperation among governments. Is this a timely subject now? I think you know that most of the rest of the world is really, really upset about climate change and the man-made part. If you get all your news from certain sources in the United States, you would say, well, that's not an issue because all the pundits say it's just all made up by the Chinese. Well, I'm sorry, I think it's not. And if you were a farmer and struggled through the summer, I just struggled through with the long drought followed by the heavy rains, you say, something's going on. Sound like another political camp, something's going on. Uh, but it is. And look at how hard, maybe how impossible it is for various nation state governments to come together and reach any kind of meaningful, helpful agreement on what we might do about climate change. Everything is followed up with our own self-interest, our own needs, our own politics, and so on. We need religious support, and I think it's wonderful. There are groups that are saying our stewardship of this planet is part of our religion, and we have a moral obligation to do it better than we have been doing it. So statecraft, ethics, and religion, can they ever keep pace with science? I'm not sure. The science can get us there, but if we as a species decide we're going to make it, we'll make the sacrifices we need, we'll work together to overcome the impediments as groups try to work harmoniously together, I think we can make it. Failing that, look out for that curve called the carrying capacity because it could all come crashing down. And I think that's a good place to stop, and I thank you for your attention, and I'll try to take any questions if you have any. Oops, we went past 8 o'clock. We went past 8 o'clock, 20 minutes over. Thank you very much. Maybe there won't be any questions. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> we have time for a few questions, and after we have our Q&A session, uh, there's a rapture that's going to follow down, or a rapture that's going to follow. We're, gonna have a, <laughs> we're all going to just disappear. <laughs> no, we're going to have a reception down a rapture below with some, some refreshments and more opportunity for question and answer. I also want to thank Dr. Soik in particular. He donated his speaker stipend to our college scholarship fund. So again, investing in our students. Thank you. Well, that's, that's the best part of it. Uh, I'd give more if I had it. Please also mark your calendars for uh, our next colloquium series talk, Dr. Dave Richards, Professor of Physics.
He's going to present a talk on manipulating time using science, technology, and literature, November 1st. But now we have some time for some questions. If there are any. Yes. Hi, Dr. Hi. One quick question. Um, I've been reading a lot about how algae production has been a great food source and everything. Um, a lot of countries I've read have mm -hmm. been kind of implementing it. Does that, uh, do you think we can make this into a larger scale for the rest of the world? Yeah. Or is it going to just stay like a small kind of it, It'll be tiny one part? of many, many things. Like I mentioned, eating other things. Many algae are edible. You gotta be careful. The unicellular algae, you've got an issue with surface to volume. There's a lot of the outside integument versus the amount of material inside. And if it was going to be a significant part of your diet, you would be eating an awful lot of that outside part, much of which is very poorly digestible by human beings. Could these be supplements to food? Of course they can. If you ever go and buy bologna, you know, lunch meat at the store, it's not whole meat, and it's not flour. It's microbes ground up, yeast and things, that are meat extenders, that have pretty nice flavors, that don't hurt anything. People have been eating it for years and years, and I don't know that anybody's been hampered by it, and I think people like the product in many cases. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that that we can do. So, again, food technology, biology, agricultural techniques, we are up to the task. Can our leaders and can we as informed citizens make it all come together in a way that we can live in a more harmonious world that's well-fed and cuts down on war and cuts down on conflict and cuts down on interfering with transportation and so on? I think that's an open question. Other things? Hi. Um, you had mentioned, uh, I guess, cheap fuel prices and yeah. their, their impact on um, food production. I was curious what, what uh, I guess, affect, uh, you know, putting a uh, price on carbon and, um, you know, cap yeah. trade policies would have on food production. It, well, it, if, you, if you believe in, in the carbon trade-offs and things, agriculture is a business, okay? And we burn fossil fuels. We, if you, if you do things like use anhydrous ammonia, do you know where we get that? We get it out of the atmosphere, but I think still that... What is it, the Haber process? Is that what it is? Yeah, where you cook the you-know-what out of, out of air to reduce nitrogen, but it's enormously expensive with fossil fuels. It takes space. It takes other energy to ignite things and everything. Then you've got to transport it around. Yeah, some of that stuff is, is, uh, is very polluting and very dangerous, and so then if you get really cheap fuels, you can do more of it, if it becomes more expensive, you've got to back off and you make, have to make really tough decisions. Do I drive my car or do I pay a lot more for a loaf of bread? And those are, those are things that Americans, thank heaven, have been spared for many, many decades now. We have not, as a general population, had to make those tough trade-offs. We've got to remember that a significant part of the world lives with that every day. Okay. Hi. Right under my nose, yeah. as they say. Yeah. Um, do you honestly feel like the pesticide runoff is like a big deal, or do you think like the insects like destroying the plants would be worse? Like, well, there's a there's that? a choice to make, yeah. right? Would you rather drink a cup of vinegar or a cup of bleach? Uh, I mean, two I bad choices. So bad. Yeah, you 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 certain we certainly put on the pesticides because we are expecting a good result. You put on the pesticide, costs money cost time and energy. You put it on because you want a good result. By and large, we get it. Is it free? Well, we could do it better. If you do get a lot of runoff, this is an issue. I just had dinner tonight with a member of this faculty who raises bees, and he gave me some of his beautiful honey, and I just clutched it because my bees all died this year, and I don't quite know why but I'm like an awful lot of other people in Pennsylvania who've been losing their bees. Is it pesticides? Is it other stuff? I don't know. 
but I'm worried. That's not a, that's not a very precise answer, but I think it's an honest answer, okay? I don't know, but I, I, I would be cautious. What is an insecticide? What does side mean? It means kill. What are bugs? They're animals. What are we? I mean, read the label on some of this stuff. That's right. But, you know, when we're killing them, we're also killing our own native bugs. We don't have insecticides that are so precise that they'll kill that bug that's killing all our ash trees and then not touch the, the ladybugs and the lightning bugs and the potato bugs and all that stuff. It kills everything. And that's, that's again, something to be concerned about. Of course, the horror story was DDT, which was so effective, and we, we forget that. It was terribly important at the end of the Second World War. I mean, people were covered with lice and awful stuff, and to shoot DDT all over them and everything probably saved a lot of human beings, but really screwed up the ecosystem. Could we afford to back up and take it out? We could. But what if we became so dependent on it we couldn't back up? Then you're getting toward the problem on that carrying capacity curve where we might destroy the very things we have to have to survive. So it's tricky. Anytime you mess with Mother Nature, she might slap you back. Right? Yeah. Ah, I'll, but I'll walk out with you if you want. But we have plenty of time to come downstairs. Sure. Thank you again for coming. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Story. Thank you. What nice questions. These are good students. They're very pleasant, very nice young people. They, I gave them lots of. Lots of opportunities to smack me across the side of the face. <laughs> <laughs>